Okay, well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Barlon. In terms of announcements, on Monday, uh, the 18th, I will have Alma Allred on to discuss the topic of Mormon fundamentalism, particularly the AUB, and doctrinal differences between various Mormon fundamentalist groups with themselves, as well as the LDS Church and Mormon fundamentalist groups as well. Uh, Alma will be joining us from uh, Rome. And if he's ever called as a bishop there, I think that gives him the charism of infallibility. I'll have to ask him. And on the 23rd, on Saturday, we will have Jacob Vedrine on to discuss his work on Joseph Smith's theology of the then future reinstitution of animal sacrifice. Um, it's a topic I've studied as well here and there over the years. So, uh, and Jacob has done a lot of uh, interesting research on that. And we'll be discussing Joseph Smith's teachings, but as well as biblical texts as well, such as Ezekiel's eschatological temple in Ezekiel 40 to 48, and the teaching about animal sacrifices there and other uh, fun topics. So, uh, and also in terms of announcements, uh, there's been some movement on my visa for those who have been wondering about it and if for those who've been keeping uh, me and my prayers with respect to that, um, the IRS seem to have accepted the NPO status of my workplace. So hopefully that will actually um, mean I will be back in the States in the near future. So um, hopefully more positive news uh, for coming on that. We are on Patreon at scripturalmormonism.com forward slash uh, patreon.com forward slash scripturalmormonism and PayPal at paypal.me dot forward slash Irish LDS for those who wish to um, support the podcast. Today we have um, Adam Stokes um, on today. Uh, Adam, I first came across Adam by uh, through reading his excellent article, which I will be linking in the show notes, The People of Canaan, A New Reading of Moses 7, that was published by The Interpreter Journal, uh, of which I actually am a contributing editor of. Uh, he's also published a couple of uh, books, so I will also include in the show notes his Amazon author page on Amazon. Um, Amazon.com. He is also an ordained apostle and elder of a group called the Church of Jesus Christ with the Elijah message, the assured way of the Lord. So today's episode will be on the topic of this particular denomination within the broad Mormon spectrum. And hopefully we can actually have him on as well in the near future because he's a uh, fellow theology Mormon studies nerd. So uh, Adam, uh, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, Rob. Thanks for having me. Um, my pleasure. Uh, for those who uh, may be wondering, um, maybe if you could give like a general background to like who you are, like uh, what's your education, what's your background when it comes to, say, Mormonism, and also what do you do for a living and what are your interests? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So my background is in religious studies. I've always been fascinated with uh, religion. Um, so I majored in Hebrew Bible in college um, at Duke University. Uh, went to a uh, divinity school at uh, Yale. I was hoping to be a Baptist minister at the time, was raised in uh, the African-American uh, Baptist tradition. Um, and then from there, I decided to go uh, pursue a PhD um, in Old Testament, focusing on wisdom literature. Now, the PhD thing didn't really work out, but um, I've still always had a major interest in uh, religion. I, uh, Work was on uh, text, different manuscripts of uh, wisdom books. So in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Uh, uh, for those listening, just sorry about that. Like it kind of cut in and out. Um, you were mentioning like how you were about to do. Uh, you were planning on doing a PhD in wisdom uh, literature. Yes. Yes. So um, I. Uh, for a couple of years, um, I tried to pursue a PhD in uh, the wisdom books of the Old Testament. My focus was on Job. That didn't quite work out. Um, so I had to figure out something to do with my skills. And I ended up uh, being a high school uh, Latin teacher. So that's been my profession uh, for the past eight years. Now, I still get my toes kind of wet in uh, academia. I've been teaching as an adjunct at St. Joseph's University uh, for 11, 12 years now. So still not quite out of the realm of biblical studies um, entirely. Uh, now with my own uh, personal uh, faith journey, uh, like I said, I was raised Baptist. And around the time that uh, things fell apart with my PhD, um, I kind of had a faith crisis for a couple of years. I was unaffiliated uh, with any faith tradition at all. Um, and then I came across at a Society of Biblical Literature conference. That's the big, uh, that's the big uh, Bible conference that everyone goes to. Um, I still hadn't quite left uh, biblical studies yet, 
Um, but I was, uh, it was just a troublesome time in my life. Um, I found at the BYU kiosk a copy on CD of Joseph Smith's Old Testament translation. And I started to read that. I was utterly fascinated by it, Rob, because it presented a much different biblical narrative than the one that I was used to. And what I mean by that is that in the Protestant tradition, there is this whole sense of, um, to use Calvinistic terms, total depravity. Um, that no matter what we do, you know, Adam, the first, and not me, but the first Adam screwed, messed up, and uh, we're all suffering uh, because of that. And there's nothing we can do because of that. And the Joseph Smith translation, uh, Moses uh, 1 through to 8 for you LDS guys, uh, provided a different picture of that where Adam is forgiven by God and is in fact exalted uh, to the priesthood. And I found that just a, such a, a positive different reading of, you know, the creation uh, of the creation story and the story of Adam and the story of humankind than what was traditionally taught to me uh, within the Protestant tradition. And so that led me to wanting to read uh, more of uh, Joseph Smith's work, uh, which led me, uh, not surprisingly, to the Book of Mormon, which was translated by him. And I remember this, I tell people this, um, I... I was celebrating my one year anniversary with my wife. We were at the hotel uh, Marriott in Princeton and she went out to get Chinese food for us. And I found a copy of the book of Mormon uh, inside, uh, inside our room. And so I start reading it. And what happened, Rob, is that I basically had a mystical experience uh, with the book of Mormon. Um, and the best way, the only way I can describe it is for a brief, short, a brief amount of time, I was transported into the world of the Lamanites. And I was, in, I was in the woods, I was in the forest, and I saw some Lamanites. And that's all I can go into with that. But when the vision, when the experience ended, I knew, and I didn't know a darn thing about, about the Book of Mormon. Now, I had Mormon friends, um, some of them that you, that you know. Um, I, had them, uh, I had Mormon friends at Yale, um, but I didn't know anything about the Book of Mormon itself. But immediately after this experience, I knew that the Book of Mormon was, was true, and I wanted to be part of a community uh, that for uh, which the Book of Mormon uh, was sacred was sacred scripture. So uh, there was a community of Christ Church uh, down the street from me uh, in Pennsylvania, um, in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, where we were living at the time. I joined up with them, and uh, then a couple years later, uh, for reasons that you know I'm sure we'll get into, um, I joined with the Elijah Message Church, and that's where I'm currently an elder. Well, thanks for that. I uh, appreciate uh, you. Sorry, that was really long. <laughs> oh, no, no. Take, take as long as you want. Um, I want this to be an informative uh, episode. You just mentioned the JST. Um, there's a number of very good resources in uh, recent years that have been published on it. Um, Kent B. Jackson has a very good book that was um, yes. on the nature of the JST. He also has a very good side-by-side -side of the King James and the JST manuscripts as well, which I'm working on. I wanted through. that book. I saw that on Deseret, and I'm trying to save up money for it. But my wife's going to get mad if I spend over like $40 on a book. But I, I, I'm not married, so I don't have that burden yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, Ken Jackson has done a lot of very good work on that as well. And I hope to have Kevin Burney on once his work uh, awesome. has been published as well on the JST. Um, I reached out to yeah. Kevin and he's agreed to come on when it's been published by, um, by Common Consent Press. Yeah. Um, but no, I appreciate uh, sharing your, uh, your, uh, your story. Just in terms of your Baptist background, uh, would it be Arminian or Reformed? Um, because Baptists coming oh, different flavors. definitely, Ar definitely Arminian. Okay. So, so like universal um, atonement, and for those who may be wondering, that basically means universal atonement, although man has, he's fallen, they still have a free will, even if, even if it's diminished and yes. not strict predestination as opposed so, to. So yeah, not like Spurgeon with, uh, Spurgeon's reform. So it's pre strict predestination, uh, no predestination. You have the free will to accept Jesus, but that is basically all that you can do. Uh, when I look back on it, uh, I loved my Baptist church growing up, but a lot of that, um, to me, if you're saying that's all you can do, uh, just in my opinion, that's kind of, that's kind of problematic, but yes, Arminian, uh, Arminius really kind of influences, uh, American uh, Baptist Baptist thought here. There's not too much Reformed Baptist. In fact, the Reformed Baptists, I would say, are kind of like the conservative Calvinist over here um, in the in in the United States. So, yeah. Okay, no, just, just curious because um, it's it's um, most of, as you know most of the theological critics of like uh, Mormonism, regardless of the group one belongs to, tends to come from a Reformed or Calvinistic uh, bent. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm just curious about that. Um, okay, so you mentioned like how uh, you were a Baptist for a while, but like after these uh, spiritual experiences, you wanted to embrace a group that uh, embraced the uh, Book of Mormon, uh, and you were a member yes. of the Community of Christ. How long were you a member of the Community of Christ? And perhaps you could tell I was me... a member of the Community of Christ officially for about five years. Okay. Um, and what was the, uh, was there any particular draw of the community of Christ beyond the Book of Mormon, or was it simply like at the prior he was belief in the Book of Mormon and uh, acceptance of uh, that as a result? Yeah, um, there's a couple of things. Honestly, Rob, um, part of it was convenience. The church was right down the street, and um, I, it was a wonderful congregation I was with. Um, the church has since been like COVID hit it, and it's just um, it's just it, it's pretty much done now, uh, sadly. So I think the members are meeting like at their homes and stuff like that. But um, the church was very traditional RLDS, meaning that it believed in the three standard books, the inspired version or Joseph Smith translation, the Book of Mormon and the RLDS doctrine and covenants um, and in the historicity of all of those. So it was different. Um, the, the local church on the ground uh, was much different uh, than kind of uh, the administration of uh the community of christ yeah and um we were just briefly shining about this uh before the episode started but like you mentioned like and you just mentioned it again now like it was a conservative more historically minded or lds group when the community of christ yes um could you explain like what you mean by that and perhaps i could explain like uh could lead into like why you become a member of your current denomination as well yes yeah, so basically um trying to there's a lot of history here so before the 1980s um basically the rlds i know uh people would uh kind of criticize me for saying this but it was very kind it was traditional in a way uh similar to the lds church so um the lds church has you know you have your triple combination um you know the book of mormon pearl of great price doctrine and covenants we had our three standard works um and basically believing uh, in the historicity of the restoration, um, in the priesthood ordinances established, you know, by Joseph Smith. Um, very, uh, yeah, basically uh, very conservative, very, very traditional. Um, and in the community of Christ, if you're familiar with the history of that, um, that starts to change in uh, the 80s. And it takes a much more uh, kind of liberal bent. Um, and I'm not criticizing all of it. One of the things that drew me to the community of Christ also was their emphasis on uh, peace. Uh, when I was floating around before, um, in between being a Baptist and the Restoration, um, I'd sometimes attend Quaker services and uh, they were very uh, interested in peace. So that was something that that drew me. But what something that I could never quite get over and the more I got into the community of Christ, the more this appeared to be the case, was that uh, they rejected basically the historicity of uh, the Restoration uh, and uh, the Mormon tradition. Now, the community of Christ joined with the World Council of Churches in the 90s. And one of the things that they had to do in order to join the World Council of Churches was reject, uh, how can I say it? Um, maybe that's too strong of a word or maybe not reject uh, the Book of Mormon. Um, so you start to get uh, basically a position that the Book of Mormon is just um, at best, at best inspired fiction um, and at worst something that Joseph Smith uh, just invented, you know, in his head. And I just had a real problem with that because I hadn't experienced the Book of Mormon. I knew it to be true. And, you know, it's like, how can I put it? You're in, you decide to join a group and there's some things you don't agree with. And you think that, you know, you can stay in the group, even if you don't agree with some of these things, but it was just, it was really frustrating over and over to just see how the community of Christ uh, just uh, put the book of Mormon literally to the sidelines. I mean, it's not even in their liturgy. Um, I was telling you at, at best, you'll get a couple of lines from the doctrine of covenants. Um, for, for certain uh, for certain liturgical formulas, um, but it's not really a part of them anymore. Um, I was at a wonderful Community of Christ Church in Chicago, uh, Southside, African American Community of Christ Church, and uh, the pastor there, wonderful lady, but she didn't even know anything about about the Book of Mormon. So there's a whole generation with you know kind of the moves that happened in the 80s and in the 90s. There's a whole generation in the Community of Christ 
that doesn't even know what for me is should be the core essential part uh, of their faith tradition, uh, which is uh, the Book of Mormon and the revelations of uh, the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, and so um, I just found that very problematic. I wasn't the only one. There was actually, uh, we had some members of the church that actually alternated between Pennsylvania and Kirtland, Ohio. In fact, they worked for the Kirtland, Ohio Temple, and they eventually left and joined the Temple Lot Group. Um, and what happened with me is that I started um, being curious uh, about uh, this church, the Elijah Message Church. I started a correspondence with them. Uh, they sent me some of their literature. And what ended up happening was that I found myself closer in my theological beliefs to uh, what the Elijah Message Church uh, was preaching rather than the community of Christ. Um, so uh, that started the process of me uh, transitioning and going to that church. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, for those who are wondering, um, the functional position these days of the community of Christ uh, would be maybe the Book of Mormon is like uh, inspired fiction. It's parabolic, but there's no historicity. Yeah. No, there was no historical Empress. Nephi. There was no Jesus who appeared in somewhere in the New World, regardless of your geographical model. And they seem to have transposed that onto like the first vision and the priesthood restoration and some of the yeah. more... Um, uh, hardline claims Joseph Smith made about his prophetic claims and visions and so forth. And my friend Stephen Smoot actually has a very good article, which is in the Interpreter Journal as well, the Imperative for a Histori uh, Book of Mormon, histor uh, the Imperative for a Historical Book of Mormon, which kind of shows the uh, nonsense of a purely inspired fictional approach to the Book of Mormon. Yeah, um, because good article. A a as my late friend Bill Hamblin often pointed out, like you can't explain the gold plates, you can't explain the angel, and you can't explain like a lot of the. Um, background story of the Book of Mormon if it's purely fiction. Now, that's not a claim, like, the, the, there might be no parables or, like, exaggerations or what have you, like, there is in the Bible. Well, there's, but yeah. there's clearly a historical court. They had to be historical Moronite. They had to be historical Nephi. There had to be historical plates, and there were physical plates. Ergo, there was some Nephites and Lamanites somewhere. Yeah. Minimally. Yeah. yeah so... Um, and for those who are saying, like, uh, this might be, like, um, this is incorrect, this is not the position of the community of Christ, um, I'm not a fan of, like, recommending anything by uh, John DeLynn and Mormon stories, but do watch the three-part interview he did with the current president of the community of Christ, and um, that's that's a man who does not believe that the Book of Mormon needs to be taken seriously, or that Joseph yeah. functionally told the truth. Well, President, president VZ explicitly said, you know, the Book of Mormon is problematic due to its racial views, so he brings in, you know, the Lamanite, uh, the Lamanite curse. And their official, the official policy is that you do not have to believe in the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants in order to be baptized into the community of Christ. So basically, um, it's just basically become another Christian denomination. And if that's the case, then, then what's the point of the restoration? No, I agree with you. Like the, uh, I, I am more respectful, like, say, some of the more hardcore elements of the ORLDS who broke off and started their own groups. That, yeah. e even if yeah. theologically I would disagree with some of their claims, then what is now functionally Unitarian Universalism. Um, yeah. you know, and frankly, like the rejection of the necessity of the Book of Mormon as inspired scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants is, I'll be blunt, at least for me, rank heresy. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so you mentioned like how, um, how you started a correspondence with the uh, group called the Church of Christ with the Elijah Message. Now, um, the reason why I actually asked you on today is like you're an ordained apostle and elder in this particular denomination. Um, and also, like, this is a group, uh, there's some groups out there when the broad Mormon restorationist perspective that there's a lot of literature on, you know, the LDS Church, or, you know, the Brighamites, mm -hmm. which I belong to, Yeah, the, ver the various uh, Josephites, aka the OR-LDS and Community of Christ, and their groups as well, and even, like, the Strangites, you know, and their various um, inclinations. Yeah. Uh, there's not actually a lot out there, and I will actually admit, although I'd like to be consider myself well-read in like uh, Mormon stu stories, studies, I should say. Um, not Mormon stories, because that's just a dreadful podcast. Uh, Mormon studies. Um, at the same time, I will admit, I don't actually know too much about that group. Uh, there's not a lot of literature here, and maybe it's because I'm in Ireland and stuff like that, and you basically have the LDS church, and that's basically, yes, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, I thought this would be like very educational because if I don't know too much, and not to sound arrogant, I'm sure like a lot of other people, even those who are well read in like LDS studies, when I mean Mormonism, uh, would actually appreciate like uh, an informed individual and someone who actually ranks highly in the excellence of the church coming on and like given in brief overview like the the history and the doctrines of the uh, group. And because you're familiar with the LDS, I'm sure you can say yeah. compare and contrast as well. Yeah, absolutely. So like um, you know. 
firstly, I'm sure like some are wondering, like, how did you uh, become an, an ordained, not just an ordained elder, but an ordained apostle in the church? And also, like, uh, maybe if you were to give like a brief overview, like, say, the history of the group as well, and take as long as you want. Yes. So um, I actually came into the Elijah Message Church through my correspondence with one of its apostles, um, who kind of became like a, a spiritual head to me, um, Michael Greenwell. He has since passed. Um, he passed uh, shortly after I was uh, ordained into the church. Um, but uh, I had a correspondence with him for several years. He came uh, all the way from Kansas City, Missouri, uh, out here to uh, Beverly, New Jersey, Burlington, New Jersey, where I live now, met my family and everything. So we talked. Um, this wasn't uh, basically a, a random uh, decision. Uh, we went through the scriptures together, uh, both the Book of Mormon. We call it the record of the Nephites. I'll get into that. Um, but uh, both the Book of Mormon and uh, the messages that uh, we believe were given by uh, John the Baptist. Um, so uh, I was very, uh, when I decided to join, I was very knowledgeable about the traditions of the Elijah Message Church. Um, and I um, firmly believed uh, kind of in its mission and uh, in its goals. Um, so um, it was about maybe four years that I corresponded, three years I corresponded with uh, Apostle, uh, Apostle Greenwell and uh, then made the decision uh, to be baptized. And so um, this was kind of a crazy time. It was right uh, during uh, the beginning of COVID. Um, so we ended up uh, driving uh, meeting halfway in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and um, I was baptized. I was baptized there. So, and I've been serving the church uh, for the past uh, two, three years now. So, um, so that's how everything happened. Now, um, some historical background about the Elijah Message Church. We basically are an offshoot of another smaller branch of the Restoration, which is the Temple Lot Church. Uh, now, the Temple Lot. Um, so you may be familiar with Granville Hendricks. Um, he uh, basically uh, wanted to go back to Joseph Smith's uh, Joseph Smith's goal of establishing a temple in Independence, Missouri. So the temple is a very big theme, not only for the Temple Lot Church, but for us in the Elijah Message uh, Church as well. So basically, creating a people, creating a culture that will be ready to rebuild the temple so that uh, Christ uh, can return. Um, so the temple lot, we have our general assembly every year um, and the place we usually have it, we rent out a community of Christ church um, and right near the temple lot. We always go in the temple lot. I have some pictures of it, uh, but that's very, uh, that's a very sacred uh, place for us. And really uh, what uh, for us is considered uh, to be the, uh, culmination of Joseph Smith's uh, ministry. And it's interesting because if you talk to um, other restoration uh, traditions, if you talk to ex-Mormons, everybody makes a big stink about Joseph Smith's polygamy. Um, that's the great, uh, that's the great horrible sin that Joseph Smith had. That's not the case for our tradition. Uh, for our tradition, what Joseph Smith's, Joseph Smith's sin was that he did not complete the temple. He did not finish building the temple in Independence, uh, Missouri. So he had a threefold uh, ministry. One, to establish, to reestablish Christ's church as it was in the time of the apostles. Two, to bring forth a new set of scripture, the Book of Mormon. And then three, to reestablish, I mean, to build uh, the church at the temple lot where the Garden of Eden once stood, Adam on Diamon, uh, that area, uh, so that Christ uh, can come again. So uh, that's a big part of our tradition. That's where we agree with the temple lot. Where we disagree is that we accept um, 120 messages uh, that we believe were sent by John the Baptist. First to uh, one of our, our founding elder, uh, Otto Fetting, uh, in the 1920s, and then uh, to the elder that came after him in the 1930s, W.A. Draves. Um, so these guys received revelations from John the Baptist from 1927 all the way to 1994. Um, and uh, we have those collected as the word of the Lord. So um, that is our third book of scripture. So we um, have 
the King James Version of the Bible, just like you guys do in the LDS tradition. We have the Book of Mormon, which we call uh, the record of the Nephites. We have the Book of Commandments, and we have uh, the Word of the Lord. Now, let me say a couple of things about the Book of uh, about the record of the Nephites and why we use the Book of Commandments. Um, so, the term record of the Nephites that actually comes in through the influence of uh, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, David Whitmer. So, if you're familiar, um, there's a great movie, by the way. Uh, the shout out to the Interpreter Foundation. Um, Dan Peterson uh, made this movie, Witnesses which is all about David Whitmer's uh, story about uh, seeing uh, the, the, the gold plates um, and his interaction with Joseph Smith. Great film. Uh, are you still there? Sorry, I had an interruption. Oh, no, no, you're still there. Your video just dropped, but your audio was fine. So uh, David okay. Whitmer and you. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, so great film um, about, uh, about David Whitmer. Anyway, David Whitmer goes off later and he forms his own church. And he, uh, because of just hostility towards Mormonism in the late 19th century, uh, Mormonism was kind of like, you know, the Irish and, you know, freed black slaves um, in, the late in the late 19th century, just something that was really persecuted. He decides to try and take some heat off of that. So instead of calling the Book of Mormon the Book of Mormon, he calls it the record of the Nephites. And that carries over into our tradition through the temple lot, because when David Whitmer dies, a lot of his church members go with the temple lot, and then uh, that phrase uh, persists with uh, the Elijah Message Church. So we call it uh, the record of the Nephites. Um, also, with the Book of Commandments, that also comes from David Whitmer. David Whitmer wanted to do kind of a reformation of the Restoration, and he thought that um, after Sidney Rigdon, uh, Mormonism kind of became uh, corrupted. Um, if you read his address to all believers in Christ, um, it's just a, basically a Sidney Rigdon hate track. He just hated on Sidney Rigdon so much. It's just nothing but hatred for Sidney Rigdon. It's kind of funny, actually. I, I think it's hilarious. But anyway, Sidney Rigdon messed up Mormonism. So it wasn't Joseph Smith. It wasn't even Brigham Young. Sidney Rigdon. So uh, Sidney Rigdon messed up, messed up Mormonism. So you got to go back to uh, <laughs> before Joseph Smith met that, met that evil Sidney Rigdon. And so if you do that, that takes you to the Book of Commandments over and above the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, um, I'll just say, I'll preface, I'll, I'll uh, just stay here that a lot of us in the Elijah Message Church, we're coming from uh, the RLDS, the Community of Christ Tradition. So this, it gets a little vague here. A lot of us still accept uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, even though that's not our official, um, our official uh, book of, of Scripture. So... Uh, there's still a lot of us who read the Doctrine and Covenants, interact with the Doctrine and Covenants, including myself. And we even actually officially accept some of the Doctrine and uh, Covenants Revelation. So Revelation, uh, in L your LDS Doctrine and Covenants, Revelation 84, is really, really, really important and really, really big uh, for us. That's the revelation on the temple being built in Missouri and the priesthood ordinance is given to John the Baptist. That is a biggie, and uh, that is, at least in our literature, that's canon for us. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so how, uh, how many members of the uh, denomination do you think uh, are you were um, of the figures? Yeah, so a um, couple of things about our denomination. We split up actually into three different groups. When W.A. Draves uh, passed in 1994, there was a schism. So we split into two groups. And then um, there was another schism in 2003 um, over, over a revelation given uh, by an apostle, uh, Mervyn Johnson. Um, and so there was another split. We probably have at least about 10,000 members if we combined everybody. In my, uh, in, in the assured way, uh, the tradition that I'm a part of, um, we have uh, less members in the United States, but we have thousands of members in Africa. Our African ministry ha has really thrived um, and has really uh, has done very well. So there are actually more uh, members in Africa than there are uh, than there are here. And with respect to say the uh, various uh, groups in the broad um, Elijah Message uh, category, yes. are there any substantial differences in terms of a doctrine or practice? Yes. Um, so um, one major difference is that uh, there is one Elijah Message tradition 
that has received, that claims to have received new revelations. Uh, we don't accept those revelations, but they claim to have received new revelations from John the Baptist. Um, so they have about 130 some messages, uh, whereas um, our group and another group, we call them the 608 Church, uh, we only accept 120 messages. Um, also, our Christology is different. So um, I think that with the 608 Church, don't quote me here, but I'm pretty sure I'm correct about this. Um, very similar to RLDS uh, Christology, which is similar to LDS doctrine, Christology, which is that Jesus and God the Father are two distinct and separate persons. For my church, the Assured Way, um, it's basically, uh, my Christology is basically modalism or Sabellianism. Uh, we believe that only Jesus is God, but that Jesus manifests in three different forms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, now, the question that I've been asked, I was actually asked this by a very prominent uh, Mormon scholar, is what the heck do we do with uh, the first vision? Uh, well, we accept the original, um, the earliest vision, um, and I know ex-Mormons make a, make a big stink about this, that they're all contradictory. I don't think they're contradictory, um, but um, we accept the first vision with uh, where Joseph Smith talks about only seeing Jesus. Now, I don't think that doesn't mean that he didn't see God the Father, but you know, at that particular time when he wrote the vision, um, he says that he just saw he just saw Jesus. So we interpret that as him when he saw Jesus, he basically saw all three persons of the Godhead. Okay, well, uh, I'm a Christology nerd. I'll admit that's my favorite topic to discuss. So maybe we can circle back to that near the end. But um, definitely, do do want, definitely do want to discuss that briefly with you. But um, yes. when, when it comes to say um, your group does not accept, like say. Uh, these kind of modern revelations from some of the other groups. Is that because, is there a belief that, say, public revelation, not necessarily, say, private revelation, like, say, the Spirit guiding people, but public revelation, if you will, do you believe that stopped, or do you just believe that, um, although public revelation uh, still is a possibility, it just hasn't been um, produced yeah. in reality? Yeah, um, and theologically, these are pretenders to revelation. Great question. So we actually, so there's something called the Articles, of uh, faith and practice. Um, similar to uh, the LDS Articles of Faith, but slightly longer, slightly different, though some of the wording is exactly the same. Um, it's uh, These are the Temple Lot Articles of Faith. We accept them for the all the Elijah message traditions, accept them as well. Um, and we believe, it says in the Articles of Faith, that the can of Scripture is not closed and that God continues to reveal God's self uh, to whomever uh, he, may he may choose. Um, so we definitely believe that uh, public revelation is still possible. Um, there's even in one of the Elijah messages, uh, John the Baptist says that a book will come forth talking about um, another group of ancient inhabitants who met Jesus Christ. So as you have in the Book of Mormon, um, the inhabitants of, of the Americas meet Jesus Christ. Uh, there is, according to our revelation, there's going to be another book that's going to be revealed uh, with uh, Jesus meeting um, some other ancient inhabitants. So we don't believe that we don't believe that canon is closed. We don't believe that revelation is closed. We even believe that John the Baptist will return and speak to us and give us more messages uh, one day. Um, it's interesting. Um, this is not, um, there is uh, another tradition. Uh, is it, what's it called? The remnant of, it's in England. Um, it's in London. Um, but is there's it, a Matthew a, Gill's group, uh, Matthew the Gill's Chronicles group. of Jeremiah. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, and he has the Chronicles there, uh, which interestingly is an account of Jesus meeting with uh, other ancient inhabitants. This time in the, you know, in the in England, um, but um, which sounds similar to you know what uh, what the the messenger. That's how we. That's who we call John the Baptist, the messenger. Uh, said in his revelation, but we haven't that um, officially. Uh, there's there's been no no statement made about that. And, and we all know Ireland is God's country, so don't trust anything yes. from the English. <laughs> but <laughs> joking aside, well, I, just, I, I, I just I just asked that because, like, um, I know, and you may appreciate that having a Baptist background initially. One of the uh, knee jerk reactions against say, the Book of Mormon, regardless of the denominational background, is well. Uh, I know private revelation, you know, may still continue unless you're, you're a hardcore cessationist. Public revelation, like say, biblical style prophets, apostles, books, yeah. that's a no go. So, like, that's like the a priori assumption often against say, the Book of Mormon and other revelations. But that's not the case when it comes to say rejecting like uh, these groups that claim like uh, extra canonical revelations or revelations from John the Baptist. That's not what informs it. It's just like you just don't believe that 
they're true prophets, or these uh, these are true revelations that are binding. Yeah, I mean, it's for for us to. So we have a council of uh, we have an apostolic quorum, um, and that would be something that we would have to agree on if something was a specific revelation or not. But in general, based on our articles of faith, we do believe that God still speaks to people and God gives revelation. And in fact, the reason that we had the 2003 split uh, was because even though it says in our articles of faith that God still gives revelation, um, there were people that were saying, no, the you know WA is, is gone, the messenger hasn't spoken, um, so therefore uh, these new revelations can't be true. But that contradicts what's said in the Articles of Faith. Okay, and uh, I know that there's a uh, 120 messages, so I don't expect, like, say, a uh, blow by blow. But like, uh, yeah. when it comes to say, these 120 messages, um, what, um, as you know, like when it comes to say Joseph Smith's messages or revelations, they produce like a lot of like theological nuance and like new ideas mm -hmm. and concepts. What yes. do you think are like some of the uh, most important doctrinal or even liturgical? Um, explications if you will in these messages that you think are like um very important not just for your group but like maybe like um something that the broad mormon restorationist perspective could actually uh, benefit from if you will absolutely i think there's two in particular so the first 30 messages by um otto uh fetting were about restoring the temple and just basically the importance of the temple mount for uh the restoration as kind of the culmination of uh, fulfilling uh, God's um, God's will in these latter days, um, so I think that you know, I think a lot of the restoration traditions are guilty of this. We have forgotten the importance of the Temple Lot of Adam on Diamon, of you know Independence, Missouri, that ground being you know a sacred place. Now it's interesting because all of the restoration traditions, even the LDS Church has a, has a, a visitor center there. Um, you have the Community of Christ, uh, I hesitate to use the word temple, it's technically a temple, Every, um, but <laughs> RLDS or Restoration Branches, people who have broken away from the Community of Christ, we don't call that temple, we just say it's a building. So we have the Community of Christ building there. Um, or as one ex and, put it, like a giant water slide. Yes, yes, it, yes. So um, I remember seeing that for the first time, I was like, well, what is that? But it, it does look like a water slide. So, um, and then you have the remnant, uh, church, they have a they have a building there, and the temple lot. People, of course, have their church uh, next to uh, the temple lot. So this is kind of a mecca. This is, you know, um, historically, traditionally, uh, restorationists have understood the importance of the temple site, but I think recently that's gotten lost. There's so much emphasis on other things uh, that we don't realize, even in the Doctrine and Covenants, that there are multiple messages. Uh, where uh, God commands Joseph Smith uh, to build a temple, to settle into Missouri and build a temple. So I think the emphasis, the emphasis on the temple, is is something that's very important. It needs to be re-emphasized uh, amongst restorationists. Secondly, one of the moves that um, I find really interesting is uh, the emphasis on the high role of the priesthood. Um, now, um, now LDS. Uh, you LDS guys, um, you know, you emphasize the priesthood. I don't think that's a problem with you, but I think um, that with other denominations, uh, that 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 is uh, somewhat more problematic. But in the messages, um, it basically says that the Holy Spirit of God um, is uh, the the priesthood. So when you have priesthood authority, you are basically uh, acting in a way that. Uh, provides that represents uh, the Holy Spirit interacting with people um, on earth. Really fascinating kind of uh, kind of um, doctrine. Um, there's some, in my view, there's some Eastern Orthodox things going on there. Um, but uh, the way that it merges the human with the divine, like I said, you LDS guys have no, you guys are on top of that. But I think um, other uh, branches have forgotten uh, kind of the importance and the significance of the priesthood. And if you view the priesthood in this high of a fashion, I think you have a lot of, you have uh, more respect for it, and it's going to shape how you interact with people in general and how you behave and the type of lifestyle uh, that you live. Um, so those are uh, some of the big things that are in the messages uh, that I think people can take away from them. Oh, thanks for that. Um, and there were also, I should mention, um, 
they were also uh, one of the things that legitimized the messages uh, for people, including myself. Uh, there are also prophecies in the messages, prophecies about World War II that were fulfilled, prophecies about the fall of Russia. It says that uh, basically Russia will fall in 1989, which is exactly what happened. Uh, prophecies about the civil rights movement, all these things that come to fulfillment. Uh, in the messages. Okay, well, I'll definitely try to like uh, track down a copy uh, and, uh, of the uh, messages. So um, that that would be interesting. Um, you mentioned the priesthood. I'm sure like some will be asking because um, because in the, your, uh, the first group you belong to, of course, was a pretty conservative traditional ORLDS group, and it seemed yeah. like they would believe yes, the priesthood is important, and it's a only males are ordained to the priesthood. Um, although, like it seems like the community of Christ these days. Um, have like female apostles and other priesthood holders yeah. um your group uh, would it be male only in terms of uh, priesthood ordinations our priesthood ordination is male only um so uh we have um very much like the release society for you guys with the lds we have a very very active women's ministry and in fact we've had revelations received and accepted uh from women um our hymnal uh basically uh consist of, you know, kind of revelations. Uh, God says, you know, these are the songs that you want to sing. Um, so even though we have a male priesthood, um, it's really, and I would say that our female members are basically, in many ways, the backbone of our church. Ellen Draves, who was the daughter of W.A. Draves, uh, she participates. She's old now. Um, she's, a, she's an old woman now, but she very much actively participates um, in the church. Um, and a lot of our church history, um, a lot of... Uh, Basically, um, the the structure of the church um, is is due. Uh, she's very involved uh, in that. So, um, but yes, uh, it's a male priesthood uh, for us, just as in the temple law. Yeah, and just as in the LDS church, and you know, just as God wants it to be. <laughs> um, I'm I'm not politically correct, so uh, it's okay. Okay, uh, is there anything? Uh, you I actually have, to... have a bunch of I have a bunch of uh, I actually have a lot of friends and. Uh, friends and uh, family who are uh, female, but they're ordained ministers, not in the LDS church, but in other, in other denominations. Oh yeah. And a good friend of mine, um, and, uh, Jen Roach, she was actually, she's now LDS, but she was actually an yeah. ordained Anglican minister. That's right. She was a P Episcopal minister. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, for those who want in, uh, I think it's either episode two or three where, um, myself and Jen had like a two and a half hour discussion on Anglicanism and all Mariology and all fun topics. And one future, uh, episode we hope to have is like a full several hour episode on sacramental theology and Christianity and stuff like that. So, um, I just thought I'd announce that. Uh, that will be um, that, that will be interesting. I have two books on uh, sacramental theology, uh, so um, you won't be able to get me to shut up, and you won't be able to get her to shut up. So it'll be fun. But um, yeah. So uh, anything else you want to add before, like I might like ask some specific questions, but I say the doctrines or practices of uh, the group. Um, I think you know. Uh, I'm sure some some more thoughts will come up, but fire away. Okay. Well. Um, Oh, this is gonna be fun. Uh, what? Of course, like you accept, like say the uh, the King James version of the Bible, and I'm sure, like, yes. you, there will be like the caveat. You know, even if you don't have it in the articles, you have like as far as he's translated correctly or some other um, yes qualification. Yes, we have that. Yep. But um, so of course, there's no like uh, idea like scriptural inerrancy, although like the King James is preferred. Um, at the same time, I'm sure like modern translations are allowable for at least personal study and like maybe teaching, even if not at a preaching level. Would that be correct? You know, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I actually just read an article in the uh, church uh, paper um, just talking about, uh, you know, why we rely, why we use the King James Version. So, yes, people use, um, I even have apostles who will use, you know, the NIV and stuff. We prefer the older King James Version because we feel like modern Bible translations uh, have some stuff that's been brought into them. Um, that uh, in some ways, uh, how can I put it, um, doesn't emphasize or de-emphasizes uh, the divinity of, of Christ. Um, so we prefer the um, we prefer the King James version. But yes, uh, on the ground, anybody uh, any member is free to use whatever Bible translation they want. A lot of people, including myself, um, and not just myself, but um, several of the apostles um, who come from the RLDS tradition. We use the inspired. Uh, we use the inspired version. Okay, no, that's uh, that's good. Um, I'm sorry to hear someone uses the NIV, or as I call it, the nearly inspired version. But, uh, no one's, no one's <laughs> I've never, you know what, uh, Rob? I've never in my life used the the, the NIV. So uh, 
Yeah, um, I, I have like the NIV on Bible Works and I have a print copy, but only because it's common amongst Protestant evangelicals. Um, yeah. There's some modern translations. Yeah, I, I do like like the NRSV and a few others, but like uh, that's just a dreadful translation. Um, yeah. I once joked the Lolcat Bible is actually a better translation than the NIV. Yeah, yeah. I actually I, there's things that I like about the N the NRSV. So yeah. and we I get to use that as my the academic Bible. Yeah. Um, that, that was so, the, that was the one I used as well in uh, Minute Word yeah. Study Theology. Um, it's yeah. a good modern translation, although like yeah, some no, modern translations are just dreadful. Um, yeah. But I just thought I'd ask that. Now, um, does your group actually have a temple? And even if you don't have a temple, do you still have like temple liturgy in like uh, secret rooms and um, other practices? Good question. So um, we do not have a temple. Uh, we do have a couple of meeting houses. Um, the meeting house um, I was at last year served as our headquarters. Um, it was on lease, so we actually had to move, but we have a new meeting house now. Um, so uh, we do have places. Um, and, and then in Africa, we have meeting houses as well, but no official temple um, as of, of yet. But like I said, the temple lot is important to us. So we'll go, oh, yeah, uh, especially during General Assembly, we'll go there, we'll pray. Um, we'll, we'll preach some in the temple lot church has been very nice. Um, and they let us, they let us do that. So, um, but no official, uh, temple, um, in regards to, uh, priesthood ordinances, uh, we do have, it's over here somewhere. Uh, we have a priesthood manual, uh, which basically gives us the rights for, you know, administration, administration, uh, to the sick and those who are dying, uh, baptism, um, and uh, certain uh, certain uh, verses and phrases from scripture uh, that are pertinent uh, to uh, the priesthood. Um, one of the things we often joke about this um, in the Apostles' Quorum, uh, we say that, you know, we need to take the priesthood as seriously as uh, John the Baptist, as the messenger took it, and it has, as, it ha as it has been taken uh, in the Restoration. Um, so... A um, couple years back, we decided, you know, if we are indeed priesthood, priesthood holders, we need to dress, you know, better. So, you know, suits, uh, glammed up suits, uh, suit tie, um, dress pants and everything. And, you know, we don't, we can't, you know, we just don't go to church looking, you know, looking any old way. So um, there is, I think in recent years, um, a re-emphasis on, you know, if you have on uh, the importance, you know, of the priesthood, and if you have the priesthood, that you're supposed to behave and live and dress a certain way. Sure. Now, uh, although you don't have a temple, and of course, you practice, like, say, ordinances like baptism and um, yes. other things. Um, as you know, like, say, before the temple was constructed in Joseph Smith's time, they had, like, say, um, the red brick store where, like, there would be, like, temple liturgies, if you will. Do you yes. have anything like that? Or is it, like, um, you believe these liturgical practices and these other ordinances will only become into effect once the temple in the uh, temple lot site is constructed. Yeah. Um, we don't have anything like that at the moment. Um, we believe that that, yes, exactly. We'll believe that once the temple is built, those ordinances uh, will come back into play. So Joseph Smith was getting it right. You know, he was, he had the, uh, he was given, you know, the temple ordinances and the liturgy for the temple and all that. But he just didn't build the temple in a temple lot. And that was what he was supposed to do. That would have culminated his ministry. And like I said, for us, that's his big sin. Uh, not the polygamy thing. We don't really we don't really talk about that that much. Yeah. And uh, because, like, say, there's clearly, like, some influence, um, you know, by David Whitmer on, like, say, some of the practices. Um, because, like, I believe your group doesn't actually have the office of high priest. Um, no. That, that, that was something, like, uh, David Whitmer did... Um, accused Cindy Rigdon of introducing in the new covenant yeah, era. Yeah. Um, do you believe that Joseph became a fallen prophet or do you just believe he was guilty of this sin, but at the same time he was still a true prophet and he wasn't a fallen prophet after this kind of um, escapade? We have always taken the opinion, uh, we say uh, in the messages that Joseph Smith sinned uh, before the Lord, uh, but he repented and uh, he is numbered, uh, liter and quote unquote from the uh, messages, he is numbered with the prophets of old, the prophets of the Old Testament. So we don't believe that Joseph Smith ever fell. We just believe that he didn't complete his ministry. Okay, so you wouldn't um, actually go as far as David Whitmer did in an address to all believers in Christ? No, no. Okay. So, um, yeah. So for us, uh, Joseph Smith is all, was always a prophet. Uh, we believe in his revelations. It's just that for whatever reason, um, he was supposed to finish the temple 
um, at the temple lot and didn't do so. But he, yes, um, we do not believe that he's a fallen prophet. Mm -hmm. um, we accept, you know, his revelations uh, in the Book of Mormon and the Book of Commandments. And even, as I said, some of the doctrine and covenants. No, that's, I just was uh, curious about that. Um, now, you mentioned, like, say, the uh, t the construction of the temple in the temple lot. Um, do you believe, like, that's a absolute requirement before the second coming of Christ? Um, yes. Christ absolutely. will not come, no ifs, and until that temple no is contentions built. until that temple is constructed. Yeah. It's not and contentions, also, it's necessary. It's necessary. It's absolutely, it's absolutely necessary. So, a um, couple of interesting things about that. So, um, not sure where to go uh, from here because there's a bunch, of, a bunch I can say. So, uh, we believe in the messages. Um, it basically talks about everything is going to to go to trash at the end of times. Um, so, uh, governments will become unstable. People will be fighting, uh, racial strife, uh, class strife, um, all this stuff. So, there is an underlining point in the messages, and you, you LDS guys, do this as well. Store up for yourselves food um and uh resources that you can so that when things go to pot um you will be okay and part of that message uh also includes going to the temple as a place of refuge and safety so the temple is not only going to be most importantly it's the place that jesus is going to come back jesus can't come back until that temple is built but it's also going to be a place of safety and refuge for those who believe in the restoration and who believe in God's prophets and messengers. So this will be a safe haven uh, for them. Um, so uh, as, uh, you, as you can uh, tell, the temple has not been built yet. And it's been about 100 years since uh, Otto Fetting uh, Research received his mess messages. Uh, so what happened uh, with that? Um, so after uh, Otto Fetting passes, people are like, you know, why isn't the temple being built? What are we going to do? And uh, basically, um, it's determined that, you know, one day God will uh, raise up the temple, but the people in Fetting's time weren't worthy of, of uh, building the temple. But the temple will one day uh, be built, and God will one day raise up a people who will build that temple. But yes, Rob, that temple is absolutely necessary. Um, I believe um, all the people in the Elijah Message Church believe that that temple needs to be there in order for Christ to return. And that was... Um, Joseph Smith's ministry kind of got stalled because that temple uh, was not there. And so we, as restorationists, are kind of the righteous remnant waiting for that temple, waiting for that worthy generation to build that temple. Okay, so would it be fair to say, like, uh, the construction of the temple is a necessity, but, like, as to who brings it about and when, that might be contingent. Yes, yes. Temp construction of the temple uh, necessity, who brings it about um, is, yes, very contingent. Okay, no, uh, just curious. Um, that, that's perfect. I appreciate the answer. Uh, you kind of mentioned, uh, I know this is like a huge topic, so like, um, and I know it's controversial, but like I just drop it on you. You kind of mentioned Joseph Smith's polygamy. Uh, There's some groups when the uh, broad restorationist perspective that in, have in the past, although like the oral, the yes, now community Christ have um, softened on this, like uh, have denied that Joseph was ever a polygamist. Some claimed he was a polygamist, but like it, it was a false revelation or he was deceived or he was deceiving, you know, and so forth. So like, um, is there any position your group would have when it comes to say Joseph Smith and polygamy and what LDS number as section 132 the Doctrine and Covenants yeah um so we yeah, that's a really good question so we actually take the position I think very much like uh traditional RLDS price price publishing house which I love um they wrote that book Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy um but so that's kind of the position that we take we say that that was introduced by other people so we put we put the blame as people often do on uh, on Brigham Young, but we don't believe that uh, Joseph Smith um, himself uh, actually uh, practiced uh, polygamy. But the people around him did, and the people around him tried to, I guess you could say, corrupt him into doing it. But um, again, uh, if he if he was tempted, he repented, and he's numbered with the Old Testament prophets, with the prophets of the Bible. Now. Um, this is interesting because there's Doctrine and Covenants 132, which we're pretty sure was composed by, by, by Joseph Smith. Um, so we haven't, you know, when I think about it, Rob, we haven't really addressed that. I mean, I guess the official position would be to say that we accept the Book of Commandments over and above the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Commandments as Joseph Smith's authentic revelations. But again, we're not consistent with that uh, because, like I said, some of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants 
uh, such as uh, Section 84, um, Section 27, um, and the like, uh, we definitely accept. Okay, well, I'm not going to press the issue, uh, you know, but at the same time, I was just curious. Uh, for those who are wondering, uh, the prices are like a uh, conservative or LDS couple of a tree volume work. Joseph Smith did not practice polygamy. And for the other side of the kind, my friend Brian Hales, he's tree volume work, uh, Joseph Smith and polygamy, um, as well as Joseph Smith. Uh, Joseph Smith's polygamy and Mormon polygamy documents dot org um, for those who want to look at the uh, primary source data and so forth to make their own decision. Uh, but I said I'm not going to press you on this, um, especially like if the group hasn't actually taught out like Section 132 and how to do about it. Um, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going to ask the, the apostles when I when I get back. Um, oh, please do. And when you do, like, uh, yeah. let me know what they think as well. Uh, you know, we'll do. Uh, yeah, I'd we'll do. say that. Uh, is there any? Uh, you mentioned like how you. Of course, use the Book of Mormon, although it's named a bit differently. It's the record of the Nephites. Um, is there a particular printing, uh, like say the uh, what we would say like the nineteen twenty printing or some other uh, yes. printing? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, and you'll understand why when I when I say this. So we use um, the it's a facsimile of the Palmyra edition. Uh, so the original eighteen thirty uh, Palmyra edition. In fact. Uh, we call it the Restored uh, Palmyra um, Edition. Um, so our text is based on uh, the earliest text. Um, now, the reason for that is that we believe that the earliest insights that Joseph Smith got into the Godhead, as expressed in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon or the Record of the Nephites, is the most accurate. So there are several places in the uh, Palmyra text where it calls Jesus the eternal father, and those get changed later, especially in the 1840, 1844 edition, to Jesus the son of the eternal father. So um, the Palmyra edition uh, best correlates with our Christology. Okay, and um, you, you're kind of bringing this into like the topic I wanted to uh, briefly discuss and uh, hear from you a bit, uh, and that's the issue of uh, Christology. Um, no, I'm not going to debate you on this, but like I'd like to... Uh, yeah. Your, your rationale for some of this because uh, as you know like say dan vogel and others have claimed like joseph smith's early christology was that of a form of modalism whether sabellianism or whether some trist like say the christology of michael servatius which he's yeah. messy if you've read his uh rest, restitution of christianity and for those who don't know like uh servatius actually found the pol uh discovered a circulatory system and he used that to uh as a an, an analogy for like the relationship between Theos and logos and john one and yeah. Bright mind, but like a very, I'm not even go down that. Uh, I don't think Joseph could have it, it, that's, that. That's a big rabbit hole. Um, Servetus yeah. was um, brilliant, uh, sadly killed by Calvin. Oh, he was murdered. Um, yeah. yeah. Murdered. murdered. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, he, I, 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 I cannot determine what his Christology was. I can't tell if no it's modalism can. or Arian because. He then says at times that Jesus is distinct from the I, I don't know what's going on. I, I, I think he was inconsistent. I think like uh, using, he was. Uh, modalism and Arianism. I don't think he was Socinian, country uh, Anthony Buzzard. But no, no, absolutely that, not. Yeah, but like, uh, so we won't go down that rabbit hole. Although that would be a fun <laughs> rabbit hole to go down with you of all people. Um, when it comes to say, say, um, so it would be fair to say that your Christology um, would be a form of modalism or Sabellianism. And for those who don't know, like, God is a numerically one person, but he manifests himself it's under three masks or modes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, yes. Exactly. The person of the Father is the person of the Son and is the Holy Spirit. They're numerically one. Yes. Like the common straw man interpretation of the, tr the Trinity at times that some LDS have. Would that be, yes. uh, I, I know there's more to it, but would that be a fair um, summary of that perspective? That's fair. Yeah, that's no, that, that, that basically summarizes it up. I think that, um, interestingly, um, I would say in practice, it's basically Jesus is the father and the son. Like I said, the Holy spirit is actually reserved for kind of the priest. There's that root connection between the Holy spirit and the priesthood. So I say, um, definitely, uh, Jesus, um, and the father are one in the same. Okay. Our, okay. So we won't yeah. go into like, say the Holy spirit and the priesthood, just like the father. No, let, no. Uh, yeah. Let's just focus on the father and son. Uh, we yeah. have to say those three or four passages in what's, um, I don't know how it's enumerated off the top of my head in the 1830 edition, but like um, the current Book of Mormon, like First Nephi 11, 12, and 13, thereabouts. Um, it, is, would, it would be accepted like uh, Joseph did oversee the addition to the son of in those few passages. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay so, um, so I'm sure like some 
By the way, I would love to like dialogue on where the Book of Mormon teaches modalism or anything like that in the future, uh, if you ever want a friendly debate. But I'm not going to debate you now. Just like I'll just ask like a few questions, which I know like loads of LDS will want to ask you. Yeah, yeah, um, that's fascinating. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, so in the New Testament, there's various passages where there seems to be a numerical distinction. Like um, when I say numerical distinction, I mean like how there's a numerical distinction of persons between me and you. You know, yeah. um, between the Father and the Son, for instance. Like um, there's various visions in the Book of Mormon and the New Testament um, where like Jesus seems to be standing before the Father, like in Revelation mm -hmm. five, mm -hmm. Acts seven even a few places in the Book of Mormon where even Mosiah 15 where it says like after the ascension Christ will make intercession and there's a few other places yeah. where like Jesus prays himself you know the typical anti-modalist uh, trope if you will so yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you respond to these passages where at least only prima facie reading if I could be so bold seems to indicate that there is a numerical distinction of person yeah. between the no, that's and a, just that's as a there's really... a numerical distinction between me and you yeah I, I think that's a really good point um, one of the apostles um, I had an interesting explanation for this because we we do acknowledge that there are places where you know you have the the voice of God. Well, Jesus is down below with John the Baptist. You have uh, the voice of the Father. So so what's up with that? Jesus speaking to himself. Um, so one of the explanations that was given um, that one of the apostles raised is a possible explanation. Um, this isn't can this isn't uh, canon for us, but um, that. Jesus is the same essence as the Father. And so if something's the same essence, that makes it synonymous with whatever it comes from. So um, he gave the example of, you know, a son taking on his, his father's last name. So um, if, you know, I'm, my dad passed away last year, but if I'm Stokes, there is a sense that by being the same essence as my as my father, I am in some ways, you know, the continuation, the same. Uh, there's some synod. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's some uh, connection between me and my dad. I know that that doesn't. This is where modalism uh, kind of goes to kind of goes. Yeah, to because poop, but, because because it seems like it, uh, that kind of uh, explanation. And I know like it's an analogy, and analogies break down. That seems to be more like say Tertullian's view. Um, of the triad or some other yeah, proto yeah. logos crystal logos Christology proto yeah. triadic uh, view, if you will. Yeah, you know, I I, I, I defer to uh, the uh, classical uh, liberal von Mises who says that you know everybody uh, finds in, in in the Bible and the scriptures uh, they pinpoint their own verses and find what you know what they want to find to support them. So I think that you know. Um, those you know we we focus on those verses uh that you know say that directly identify jesus as the father um and uh some of the more problematic verses we haven't addressed as much but i think that goes vice versa you know what do we do you know what do lds people do with you know the 1830 uh book of mormon you know the 1830 edition of the book of mormon where you know it does seem that jesus and the father at least in certain places are one and the same so um at the end of the day, I mean, my own personal opinion is that, you know, um, I love that one of the things I love so much about the prophet Joseph Smith is that he made God so personal and real and close to us. And God wasn't this transcendent hypothetical thing that you get with the Unitarians and stuff like that. Um, but there's still a mystery to the Godhead and we don't sure. really, you know, we don't really know everything um, that there is, that there is to know. And this is just, you know, as the, Greek, as the Orthodox would say, this is just human language trying to describe something that to some extent is indescribable, but to some extent, as the Prophet Joseph Smith uh, did, is describable. Okay, so would it be fair to say, uh, because I'm sure like some LDS would be wondering like how the heck you can get modalism out of um, Joseph Smith's revelations. And I'm sure you can be wondering like how the heck can you actually get your idea out of uh, these texts. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, and, and here I think, you know, and I think it goes back to... Um, where do we stop the restoration? So I think that's that influence of David Whitmer on here. You know, let's stop it before Sidney Rigdon. And if we do that, we're safe. We don't have to read the King Follett discourse, which I absolutely love, by the way. I read that. Um, I read that all the time. But I, I, I um, think it should be canonized for LDS. So there you go. I absolutely think, I, I think it should be canonized. But uh, don't don't quote me on that because I technically, I'm like the position of my church is modalism. So um, I'll, I'll cut this out to the interview, okay? Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, 
um, absolutely think it should be canonized. But anyway, um, you know, it goes back to let's let's take that cutoff point, and if we take off that cutoff point and say that afterwards, you know, Joseph Smith, you know, if there was any corruption, I think my church would argue it wasn't really with the polygamy issue, but it was Sidney Rigdon being a bad influence on Joseph Smith. Yeah, um, so. I, I'm sure, like you mentioned, like Whitmer, like you would agree with Whitmer's objections, like say he changes to some of the revelations, uh, the yeah. introduction of polygamy, but also the introduction of a high priest in the new covenant, not yeah. the old, but yeah. the new covenant, and other yeah. things as well. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and for those who are wondering, uh, David Whitmer's book uh, from 1887, Addressed to All Believers in Christ, which is on archive.org or reprinted. Um, yeah. And we really, also have it on every, Everyone should read the book, um, because although, like, he's like, it's a skating attack on the Brighamites and Sinni, the very first few chapters is basically the book of mormon's a historical text yeah. i saw the angel i saw the plates yeah you know joseph told the truth at least initially yeah. and then take it from there so it, it, it's it, it's an interesting book yeah. just for that dichotomy of sorts yeah I, I think that you know if you're ever struggling um i know um you know a lot of my community of christ uh friends and some lds uh friends you know with you know the attacks that have been on the Book of Mormon recently in recent years, you know, with some of the ex-Mormons and stuff that you've mentioned, you know, I think that a great boost to your faith would be reading David Whitmer's um, address uh, to all believers, because like one of Christ's disciples, this is a person who was there at the beginning and never denied his testimony, and he's very detailed about it. This is the type of thing that I would love to have had, you know, from the Apostle Peter. I know we have his epistles in the New Testament, but saying, you know, I was there, you know, with Jesus, such and such and such and such and such. Um, and we get that with David Whitmer. Yeah. Um, and there's no denying after you read that, um, that uh, he um, that he is he's making this up or uh, just trying to uh, get attention to himself. He he saw those plates and uh, and the angel and everything that went with it. So I think, you know, it's very if you get past the Sidney Rigdon hatred um and the the Brigham Young hatred. There's less there's less Brighamite hatred than there is for Sidney Rigdon. Um, but if you get past that, um, it, it's it's a wonderful text to read. Yeah, um, and also he died a year after, and he had his testimony engraved in these tombstone. Um, yeah, all the while yeah. claimed like, uh, that Joseph was a fallen prophet. So. Uh, yeah, um, usually whenever I discuss the tree witnesses, he's the first one I bring up because, like, um, just because of that, it's like he had a yeah. lot to gain if he just like spilled the beans, if there were beans yeah. to be spilled. But just on the yeah. issue of modalism, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure if you'd be open to sure, like uh, not actually like a debate in the future, but maybe like a dialogue where it's a uh, uniquely uh, the Book of Mormon or like even the New Testament. Definitely, stuff. definitely. But, um, it would, like, yeah, friendly debate on that. But um, so it would be fair to say, like, um, in terms of say the. Um, the analogia fide, you know, if you will, like you would view like the more important text that you should privilege or the clearer text would be where Jesus is called the father. And for you, that would mean that he's the person, the father. It's not simply a title merely. Um, yeah. and these other texts and some of the more difficult texts that have to be, um, approached in like the, these clearer texts would be like, um, the throne room scene in the book of revelation or the intercession and mediation texts, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's definitely kind of a hierarchy of emphases on within scripture. So all, yeah, scripture I think like all groups like, do that. Yeah. 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 Um, it's like one of my favorite topics to discuss is the issue of baptism and how it's necessary for salvation. Um, and the gymnastics when it comes to say some groups who reject that doctrine um yeah. is amazing you know they're they're yeah. basically their response is basically ephesians 2 ignoring the colossian parallel that teaches baptism is the instrument yeah. Yeah. um and also have you ever heard of the teeth on the cross <laughs> that that's basically <laughs> it and these yeah. kind of texts answered like the very clear text they say is baptism saves baptism is the means of remission of sins and so forth yeah. even yeah. romans 6 it says you're justified by baptism um yeah. so it, the, there's no question, like, yeah, there is, like, a hierarchy, if you will, of text regards to your tradition. So um, that's not the dispute, it's just, like, whether it holds up exegetically. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, like, uh, absolutely. if you're ever down uh, in the future to, like, maybe have even a friendly dialogue or debate on these... Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. I, I, like I said, I can talk about this stuff for hours. So, just, uh, yeah. just, I'm sure, like, one other thing before we kind of go into, like, one other topic would be, like, you mentioned the first vision and how um, you believe the 1832 account is consistent with, like, say, this kind of... Um, uh, modalist understanding of yeah because he only sees jesus there yeah well he mentions he sees jesus but um for you he only sees jesus and like maybe the later text that you come from joseph when he says like the father and the son um it's basically like the two modes or manifestations but still a singular person would that be your view of the yeah i think yeah accounts? yeah i think that would definitely be the argument that we make yeah yeah okay 
uh, yeah. Um, well, as I said, like, would love to like a doll like with you, but like, um, I'll be friendly today, and I won't push <laughs> too much on that. Uh, but uh, when it comes to say. Uh, into more like say the nature of god of course like it's a form of modalism but you kind of mentioned like how you actually like the king of discourse and points for that so um do you believe like um one of joseph slater's revelations and that's what section 131 in the lds enumeration would be like there's no such thing as immer- immaterial spirit all spirit is material so would there be a view like say there's no such thing uh do you believe that spirit is material or immaterial or is that something like uh you're you can be agnostic about when the uh, elijah message group yeah so um this is interesting because we, um, so our, our messenger, John the Baptist, he calls himself a material spirit. So he is a resurrected spiritual being. So he was killed in the New Testament by uh, wicked King Herod because uh, uh, Salome, uh, Salome tricked him. Um, and he says, I'm a resurrected spiritual being, but I'm a being of matter. And um, basically uh, both Otto Fetting and W.A. Draves, they actually touch him. He hits them on the shoulder. Uh, he gives them hugs. Um, so they actually uh, make material contact with this person. So um, some of the messages go into this. I'm trying to think off the top of my head uh, what they say, but basically spirit is material. Okay, so that would be like a common view you would have with LDS because they have yes. like important theological yes. ramifications. Yes, and, we, um, and there was in the 70s, I know this for a fact, so there was kind of, this new age movement within the tradition, which went really gnostic um, saying that we are just totally spiritual and there's no such thing as matter. And a revelation was given by John the Baptist saying that's not true. Basically, spirit is equal to is material. Yeah, and the, if like a, if material was inherently uh, evil, like the Manichian, Manichaeans and others believed, uh, yeah. that results in like a very gross perversion of say the atonement and the incarnation and so forth. Um, yeah, but it's popular. Yeah. Um, so would there also be? Um, I'm just re- referencing, like, say, the LDS enumeration, but, like, uh, in section 93 of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants for LDS, and, like, the Kinfola Discourse and the Book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price, uh, there's an explication that God did create, but he did not create what we would say ex nihilo, out of nothing, but he created ex materia, you know, from pre-existing material. Yeah. Uh, would that be the uh, position of the Elijah Message Church as well? Because I ask because I know some conservative or LDS, there's a commentary, and I forget the author's name at the moment, but it came out in the 70s, that said section 93 or whatever section the number is, is not actually teaching creation out of nothing. Oh, no, sorry, creation out of pre-existing material. It's consistent with creation out of nothing, and, uh, which was kind of unusual. Yeah. So, like, uh, would creation ex materia, even if you don't use that term, uh, would be the um, position of the Elijah Message group? I don't know if we've ever had an official statement on that. Um, I think we honestly just go with, uh, with Genesis 1. Um, I do believe... Um, don't quote me on this. Um, we believe in the pre-existence of the person, just like you guys do in the LDS tradition. But there is an official rejection of reincarnation, just like there is in the LDS tradition. So one of the messages says, "There's no incar- There's no. There is no reincarnation. Such are such things come from the the evil thoughts of man. That's just basically what it says. I'm not hey, trying to an extra, insult anybody, an extra but. canonical revelation. I agree completely with. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> So Ecum- ecumenism in now uh, progress, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so like uh, one of the other questions I want to ask, like you, like you, uh, us, um, your group would believe uh, everyone personally preexists, not simply like preexists in the foreknowledge of God, you know, which is the no, no, preexisting, yeah, but personally preexisted as well. Yes, and would that be eternally so? Um. Or is that like uh, we don't have a position on that? Uh, we just affirm preexistence. I don't know if we have a position on that. Okay. Um, and what do you like, as you know, like, uh, there's like the idea, like, say, intelligences and spirit and spirit birth and like LDS circles. Is there anything uh, analogous to that? Um, or would you believe, like, as Joseph seemed to have believed, treated like intelligence and spirit as one and the same thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, and I actually think that there is one of the messages which equates intelligence with spirit, very similar to uh, DNC, uh, DNC 93, I believe. Yeah, and Abraham um, tree as well. Yeah, um, so I think that's explicitly mentioned in line with Joseph's uh, the prophet's teachings there. Cool. Yeah. So um, okay, and um, one of the other teachings um, of Joseph, um, you know, in s- w- section one thirty. So it's like a later 
revolution. Um, or actually, it's more of a composite uh, that was put uh, together later by Orson Pratt, but it comes from Joseph's uh, sermons. He's the only, like, say, God, not only he's, like, spirit material, but, like, he's an embodied being, if you will. Uh, is there, is that a uh, perspective that's taught by the Elijah Message Church, uh, divine embodiment? Um, I would say what Jesus is, um, so Jesus is our God, Jesus has a physical body, um, so yes, uh, divine, uh, uh, divine body, divine embodiment. Yes, but only after the incarnation and the ascension, not beforehand. Like Joseph seemed to have taught for God in the. Kingdom. No, I actually um, don't quote me on this. I will try to find uh, church literature on this. I think Jesus always had a body in our tradition. Okay. Um, I know at least that because when we talk about the Book of Ether and stuff like that. Um, and we affirm that Jesus had, you know, had a body uh, when he appeared to uh, when he appeared to the brother of Jared. So sure. um, I but, think, but, but that would be just like a spirit that had a three dimension body, or um, would that be just more than simply like three dimensional spirit body would be also embodiment? Um, I know this is a bit uh, technical, I'm, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm honestly not sure about that. Oh no, that's fine. Uh, but like, uh, if that is the view, like uh, some Anabaptists actually did hold to that view as well. Um, yeah. And there's actually a book by uh, Stephen Webb. Um, what's it called? Jesus I, Christ, Eternal God. That you might be interested yeah. in as well. I'm so. going to I'm going to lean towards the statement that God always had a body, um, because I know in our tradition we're very again going back to um, the kind of uh, the Gnostic controversy that we had in the 70s, 1970s. Um, the view that God is just cast for the ghost, a love, a little a spirit, um, ha is, is thoroughly rejected uh, by my uh, by my tradition, and I know in the in and the restoration um, in general. So um, I think I think we're in the, we're we're in agreement with that. Okay, no, that's perfect. Now um, you've actually have some work done on the um, Pearl of Great Price, including your Moses Seven article. So what is the uh, position of your denomination when it comes to say? Uh, the writings that one finds in the Pearl of Great Price, most notably um, the Book of Abraham and the Book of Moses. Yeah, um, officially those are rejected by the church. But like I said, um, a lot of us are coming basically as refugees from the community of Christ and what's been happening over there uh, with their rejection of the Book of Mormon and basically the historicity of the Restoration. So um, a lot of us uh, still read uh, the inspired version. Now, um, even for conservative, RL, <coughs> excuse me, conservative RLDS uh, folk, um, the Book of Abraham would have uh, been rejected as well. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit strange here, Rob, because my first exposure uh, to the Book of Mormon, I talk about, you know, that experience I had at the Marriott Hotel. Um, I couldn't keep that Book of Mormon, so the first Book of Mormon I bought was the triple combination. It had the book of Abraham in it. And I read through the whole thing. I read the book of Mormon, read through the Doctrine and Covenants and read through the Pearl of Great Price. So that was always the book of Abraham. I was always knowledgeable, knowledgeable about uh, uh, ever since, you know, I, I became affiliated with uh, the restoration, but um, that's not accepted uh, by my, by my tradition. That's not accepted uh, by the community or the R RLDS. Um, even though they do accept uh, the inspired version, which for which Moses one and eight, one through eight is the first couple chapters of Genesis. Yeah, and as I said, like I first uh, encountered Adam Truhey's article on Moses seven, and hopefully we can actually have you on in the near future to uh, discuss that um, um, in in the near future because that's always like yeah. a uh, hot topic when it comes to say race and other issues yes, like that. Yes. And that kind of brings up the uh, tricky topic. Um, one of the topics, you know, and probably like one of the more difficult topics LDS have to deal with is like the history of race and racism in the church. Yeah. Uh, we had the priesthood restriction and the temple restriction beginning in 1852. And unlike yeah. some other LDS apologists, I'm more than willing to admit that was a mistake. And although I do believe Revelation resulted in it being overturned in 1978, um, yeah. It's something I will never defend. Um, pun unintended, I think it's a black eye in the history of the LDS church. And whenever anyone asks me about it, I always try to explain. I, I don't explain it away, you know, and I often say, like, it was a mistake, yeah. but I often try to give the historical background, like, say, the issue of, like, say, Brigham Young's 1852 sermon to the uh, governors um, as governor and, like, the 19th century Protestant racism and how more it was Mormonized and so on and so forth. You know, yeah. uh, so, like, we've had our own difficulty when it comes to, like, say, race and uh, racism 
throughout church history. You know, uh, I'll happily admit that. Um, has there been like any similar issues when it comes to say race or racism when it comes to say um, when the denomination or has it been like um, a better track record in the LDS here? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because um, one of the first members of the church was an African American guy named Lacey, a Black American named uh, Lacey. That's all we know about him. And the messenger, and the messenger continues to do this with uh, prominent Black members of the church. They'll be ordained to the priesthood, but he'll say, you know, uh, your your mission is to members of your own race. Um, so uh, go back to the city that you're in, uh, go back to the town that you're in, and uh, preach only to members of your own race. And I think there's a reason for that, given, like you said, uh, kind of the racial tensions of the time period. Um, so um, there have always, in my in uh, this tradition, there have always been uh, there's always been black uh, ordination to the priesthood, um, but it's always been um, a focus directed uh, towards. So if you're ordained to the priesthood, your duty is to go towards uh, your own people, and that kind of lightens up later on in the later revelations with you know uh, civil rights era and things and race relations uh, somewhat improving uh, in the United States. Um, but even when uh, the church goes to Africa, the messenger gives a message and says, you know, African apostles, you guys are to help establish churches in your own region. Don't go beyond your own region. So there's always uh, that emphasis. Um, one thing I want to say, a lot of people I know bash, uh, they, they like to bash uh, the Salt Lake Church, the LDS Church um, for, for the priesthood restriction. But this seems to have been an issue with you know, almost all the denominations to some extent, except for the Stranghites. Um, um, that's the only denomination I can think about. But even in the RLDS church, there had to be a specific revelation given by, uh, given to Joseph Smith III, um, saying, you know, to ordain blacks in the priesthood. And it even says, don't be too hasty because this is a really kind of tense racial time. The Civil War just ended. There's a lot of animosity towards uh the, towards free blacks, people think that you know they cause this war, so just don't you know don't be don't be too quick about this. Um, so um, that's not so. I, I say all that just to say that that's uh, not just a tension that you find in the LDS Church, but it's a tension that's found in all of the Restoration branches um, uh, as, as well. As well as practically like all 19th century groups as well. Except yes, Catholic, and so. yes. And in in uh, in every nineteenth century uh, white denomination, a, a black uh, black person would not have been able to receive ordination at all. Yeah, and uh, for listeners who want a good book on the topic, um, Russell Stevenson's book for the cause of righteousness: a history of blacks and Mormonism, eighteen thirty two thousand and thirty. Yeah, uh, Russell. I used to work with Russell. Um, uh, um, and he's brilliant on this issue. So uh, that's definitely a very good book to uh, get. To um, yeah, it's really good because it goes through like the history as well as the uh, important documents with grand LDS uh, focus, yeah. but at the same time still very important. Um, yeah. I'm glad you One of the things I appreciate about his book is that, um, and this is something that this is I don't get offended a lot, Rob. This is something that uh, that actually offends me um, deeply when people think that. Black Mormons didn't exist until after 1978, um, and I'm like, yeah, no. Bill, Bill Maher, a, of, Bill Maher, for instance, uh, actually has said that I believe. So uh, yeah, yeah, which is, and, and that really just bothers me because uh, there's such a rich history. Um, and my friend uh, Janice Johnson, she does this with the Century of, of Black Mormons. Um, there's such a rich history of even after you know, like you said, 1852, um, there are Black people joining the church. They know that they can't have the priesthood. Uh, but they're still baptized in the church, and they serve the church to their utmost ability. So uh, there was even one black member who served as a deacon. So um, you know the, the view that you know there was there was nothing black in the the LDS was a lily white church until 1978, um, or that the Restoration was lily white until 1978 is just something that really bothers me. Yeah, even have Joseph Smith uh, been involved in the ordination yeah. of some black men. Most yes, of the like Elijah Abel Eagles. and Greenflake. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Although Joseph may have been a product of the 19th century, he didn't actually go as far as like some of his other contemporaries as well. No, um, no. So, but yeah, no, I just thought I'd ask that because like that's an important question. Um, it's an unfortunate question that has to be asked, uh, but it's something yeah. that has to be asked. Um, but uh, thanks for that. I appreciate that. And also the very fact that you would actually 
um, mentioned like uh, pre-1978, even when the LDS tradition of having blacks, um, I appreciate that. Um, let's see, we mentioned Christology, which we definitely have to uh, get back on. Um, just a few other things. Um, you would believe as LDS do, like uh, when it comes to say baptism and other ordinances, you must hold the priesthood to like confect these ordinances or sacraments. Yes, only, uh, only, only um, authorized priesthood holders can perform baptism and communion or sacrament, as we call it. Yeah, similar to LDS. And would you believe as LDS do that uh, baptism is the means by which you receive a remission of sins, or would you believe like yes. some other groups, it's only a symbol? No, no. Baptism is essential. So that is, um, I had to be rebaptized. Um, I not have to be, so I was baptized as a Baptist, um, no pun intended. Um, I not have to be rebaptized when I joined the community of Christ. I had to be baptized uh, to join the Elijah Message Church. That's essential. Yeah. And of course, it was John the Baptist and not John the Presbyterian for those who support Pedo baptism uh, That's a joke, but yeah. Uh, but you would believe in like a Although I know LDS don't really use this term, and I'm sure like other restorations don't, like what theologians would call baptismal regeneration, basically, yes. God uses the means of water baptism as the means by which, you know, one is regenerated, receives remission of their past and yes. sins. And the, me and the messages, um, even though they don't use that terminology, they do uh, basically state that, um, the important of baptism as regeneration. Yes. Yeah. And for those who want a book on the topic, and dare I say a good book on the topic, uh, drop me an email at scripturalmormonism at gmail.com, and I'll happily send you my 300-page uh, book um, on this particular topic, uh, Born of Water and the Spirit, the Biblical Evidence for Baptismal Regeneration. Um, but yeah, uh, that's good, because I've kind of come, unfortunately, I've actually come across some LDS who actually claim like, baptism has no self-efficacy, it's only a commandment. It's like, where the heck are you getting this? Um, yeah, I, I feel like... They, the... they prove text one or two things from Joseph Smith. Ignoring the context where he clearly explicitly teaches this, and I'm wondering, th this this is like the eyes of Jesus Protestants engaging when it comes to like imputation or justification in context, yeah. dude. <laughs> but I just thought I'd ask that just be on the safe side. Well, I mean, yeah, our, our messenger is John the Baptist, so you know, baptism is going to be essential. He was the bapt baptizer, so um, baptism is going to be essential. Yeah, and like even if you're LDS it's, and don't believe in the uh, these revelations that come from uh, John yeah. the Baptist. Um, Aaronic priesthood restoration, anyone? But yeah, uh, that, that's good. And when it comes to say the uh, nature of the, uh, the Eucharist or the communion or whatever terminology one wants to use, um, there seems to be like an allowance for like some, some kind of spiritual presence in LDS theology. Yeah. Um, would that be, what type of a presence of Christ with respect to say the, uh, of course, th there's no concept of like it being a sacrifice that appeases God's anger against sin, contra Catholicism, or yeah, no, there's there's but not there should, like any developed understanding of say Christ's presence in your tradition. Yeah, um, very uh, just very general, I would say. So not uh, definitely not what you get in Catholicism with the um, the bread and wine uh, being the body and blood of Jesus, or the bread and water being the body and blood of Jesus, um, but. Uh, Definitely. So our liturgy, um, one of our priesthood liturgies for uh, the sacrament um, is uh, the statement that Jesus makes, I believe, in third Nephi, that your spirit will always be with me. So we do acknowledge, it, acknowledge that in during the sacrament, Christ's presence is with us there in some way, um, but it's not elucidated on. It's kind of similar, actually, to um, the this goes back way back to my seminary days when I was Baptist. Um, Reformed Baptists, I think, had a very similar view of presence. So Christ is there, but it's not, it's not like a, it's not a Catholic thing with uh, the bread and the wine, um, but that there is some type of presence of Christ there. Yeah, basically, uh, would it be fair to say, like, um, for those who are in a sanctified state before God, before receiving, they have Christ's spirit present yes. in some way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I've actually argued that kind of view, uh, some kind of mystical presence view. Uh, actually kind of goes back to what we find in Ignatius of Antioch. Um, I know he's often abused to support, like, say, transubstantiation or the mass as a sacrifice, but if you actually read all his seven epistles, he seems to hold to some kind of mystical presence view. A bit more potent than spiritual presence, but at the same time, no change in the elements. Yeah. So Yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, 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 that's perfect. And you're a theology nerd, as I am, so like, uh, I'm sure you don't mind like some of these uh, kind of... Um, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love like this that. stuff. No, so do I, but I'm trying to make this into... Uh, trying to, trying to like, uh, find a balance between like want a nerd to op with a fellow nerd, but also want others <laughs> who are not as nerdy to like get as much out of understand it. Understand so, Yes, um, I totally understand. 
Because if not, like, we'd just be kind of this debating, like, the minutia of saying maybe it had in Deuteronomy 6.4 and, like, Unitarianism and modalism and stuff like that for ages. Yeah. Which, by the way, would love to, like, it wouldn't be dialogue. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. That would be pretty awesome, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Something, something fun to look forward to. Uh, and when it comes to, say, say the, um, the hereafter, you know, both in terms of, say, the intermediate stage, as well as, like, um, you know, man's final destiny, if you will, what's, yeah. what's your understanding of that? Because, like, in LDS... You know, at least in the LDS view, like there's either like say spirit prison, spirit paradise, and then there's like say the yeah. degrees of glory, and also we um, what, we don't have the three degrees of glory. There is a hell of punishment for people who reject God's will and uh, do bad things. For us, paradise is on earth, so it's kind of um, use a fancy, really fancy academic term here. Endzeit equals erzite. So paradise was man was human beings were originally in paradise in uh adam on diamond uh what is now jackson county missouri in a state of bliss uh with god um god they weren't shut off from god's presence as they were after um after the fall happened even though god still interacted with them and uh they still they still heard uh god's voice um but uh, the end time will be uh, where the righteous are gathered at the temple lot. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess God's going to make space for everybody to fit in. Um, and uh, we will dwell there in, in peace and in harmony um, with God. So uh, there's kind of an earthly uh, paradise in the same place that the original uh, paradise was. So it would be fair to say like your idea, like what we would say, call the celestial kingdom would be a marriage between heaven and earth and earth will be restored yes. to Eden yes. and then some basically. Yeah. 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 And I, I would argue that's like the LDSV as well. Um, there's unfortunate idea like heaven going in the LDS tradition, but if you eat like the Doctrine and Covenants to sell it, the, the paradisical earth is a celestial kingdom. So, yeah. um, yeah, no, that's fine. And when it comes to, say, the nature of hell, um, as you may know, like, in the LDS view, there is, like, the idea, like, say, eternal conscious torment, but, like, maybe for the sons and daughters of perdition, and that's very specific to actually qualify for that. Uh, what's your, what's your tradition's view about, say, uh, eschatological or, or end times punishment, like, when it comes to hell? Is it, like, forever? Is it conscious? Um, so forth. Um, I, I know that, at least according to the messengers, According to the messenger, um, it is, uh, I think it's forever and conscious, I think. So, but I, I also know that there is, uh, there is leeway. One of the things we like to say is that, you know, not everybody knows about uh, the, this message, the message of John the Baptist. Um, so we also think that there is some going to be some fairness uh, within God's, uh, well, as it should be fairness within God's plan. So it's a little bit ambiguous. We don't talk about hell a lot. We talk much, we talk much more, uh, Rob, about uh, what, um, what the uh, temple is going to be like at the end of days um, and the joy and um, yeah, the joy and, and the pleasure and the happiness that we'll have uh, with God's presence descending onto the temple and us being a part of that. So heaven gets more emphasized than hell. Sure. Um, go figure. Yeah, fair enough. And for better or worse, that's the same in the LDS tradition. The hell and like spirit prison are rarely ever mentioned in, except in passing. So, yeah, um, I think we kind of LDS kind of do the service by like never really mentioning this. We should because it's still there. It's an unfortunate reality. Still, yeah. But you know, yeah, that's yeah. no, perfect. And uh, we kind of could. There's like loads of other theological stuff we could go through, but like uh, at the same time, I'd like this to be a short, relatively short episode. Um, that's not going to happen because it's theology. But um, <laughs> maybe like um. When it comes to these social conservative issues, it seems like um, you would reject like a lot of the, um, and I know this term is often abused, but like say, so I'll qualify it, the regressive liberalism, if you will, of like a lot of our denominations out there. Uh, so yeah. when it comes to the, well, predict- when- oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I, like I said, I am kind of uh, moderate. I lean uh, towards, a, towards the right a little bit. Um, I have a lot of friends. Uh, from a variety of, of social cir- circles and, you know, who um, identifies a variety in a variety of different ways. Um, I know that uh, for my denomination, um, in our articles of faith, um, we have um, some explicit statements uh, within, the art- within the articles of faith um, about certain things. So uh, we are, it says that we are opposed to war um, and in matrimony, the context is uh, between 
um, of one man and one woman in the articles of faith. Um, so um, I just say that to say that's the that's the official position of our church. Um, but we, you know, like we welcome you know anybody uh, to come to us to worship with us. Sure. Um, we don't reject anybody. We don't pick out anybody. Um, and uh, like I said, I have uh, dear friends, uh, dear peers. Um, who identify in many ways and from all walks of life. Oh yeah, sure. Um, but like, um, would your would say the official moral theology, if you will, of your denomination be similar in many respects to say the moral theology yes. and ethics of the LDS? Yes. And if so, yes, exactly. is there like any points of major disagreement, or would it be like if I were to hand you like no. say a bullet point summary of like what as a Latter Day Saint, you know, a Brighamite, you know, if you will. No, it's basically the same. And in fact, the uh, the statement on marriage comes from the original doctrine in 1835 Second edition of, of the doctrine. First one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, no, that's good. Okay. No, I just thought to ask that. But you kind of mentioned like an uh, opposition to war. Would that mean like uh, you're full blown pacifists or would it be like you would have still some kind of a just war theory? No. Uh, let me, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, so, uh, men, um, let me see if I can find the Articles of Faith right here. I can tell you it. So it says, men are not justified in taking up arms. I'm reading from the 21st Article of Faith. It's, I told you it's long Articles of Faith. Are not justified in taking up of arms against their fellows, except as a last resort in defense of their lives and to preserve their liberty. So I mentioned that um, just as you'll actually get this if you uh, talk to uh, Quakers as well, uh, there are certain exceptions to this pacifism, namely um, if uh, there is a war where it seems like a person's rights are going to be infringed upon. So a uh, greatest example of this is World War II. Yeah. So the messenger says, you know, take up arms. Those, you know, if these, if these Nazis take over, everybody's in a world of trouble. Um, so uh, what the Nazis are doing is infringing on your rights and on your liberty and it's making the west an enslaved place and not a free place as god as god intended it to be so you need to take up arms uh for that so there are exceptions to that so it's not a full-blown uh not a full-blown uh, pacifism no yeah so what. like um so there will be like an allowance for what's called a just war theory if you will if it's like self yes and yeah yeah straight up it, it's have, understood, like, say, you. the lesser of many evils. Like, no one wants to go to yeah. war, you know, but if it means, like, pure evil will prevail, like Nazism and World War II, it sucks, yeah. but you have to. It's justified in this particular yes. instance. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the okay. messenger explicitly says that. Oh, no, just like when you mentioned, like, uh, war, um, I would just want to know if that was a blanket statement or if there were uh, exceptions. But no, that's perfect. Um, okay, well, uh, I appreciate that. Um, is there any other thing uh, you would like to um, discuss before we wrap things up? Uh, I think that's that's basically um, that's basically it for now. I'm trying to think. Um, our website um, for those of you interested in more information about the Elijah Message Church, I know you're going to put it up, uh, Rob. But um, it gives um, it actually has links to our scriptures, the King James Version, uh, the Record of the Nephites, and the Word of the Lord. Um, and it has uh, links to a bunch of other church literature. We have a daily, pa uh, monthly paper, The Greater Light. Um, which you can find PDF copies of online. Um, and if you shoot us an email, uh, we'll send it out to you uh, free of charge. But it contains uh, some messengers. Uh, each newspaper contains some messages in it and basically um, a lot of uh, good theological discussion. And there's a kids section as well. Oh, that's worked. And before we leave, uh, you've actually published a few books. So maybe if you were like, uh, maybe like give a brief overview of some of your publications, um, if you want. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I published a couple of books on uh, the Old Testament um, as part of my class, uh, the class I teach at St. Joseph's University. Um, perspectives, one's called Perspectives in the Old Testament, and the other one's kind of a fusion of my interest in Latin and uh, my interest in Latin and uh, the the Bible. So uh, it's called uh, the Latin Scroll Selections from the Five Megilotes. So it gives the uh, Latin text of uh, the books of Ruth, Esther. Uh, Song of Songs, Lamentations, and Ecclesiastes, uh, with my own English translation of them. Um, and then I also have books on, basically, I'm, I'm very into uh, North American history, uh, ancient North American civilization. I kind of take the heartland position that uh, the events of the Book of Mormon uh, took place in what is now the United States rather than South America. Um, not to 
uh, skew the South American position. Almost all of my all of my friends would take the South American position. You're not talking um, about, I, about it, unlike some other Heartlanders in the LDS tradition. No, no, no. Okay. So no. So, um, but uh, my book here, from Egypt to Ohio, and another book um, I have um, on the Michigan relics, looks at some of the evidence, at least for uh, Israelite uh, presence in ancient North America, which to me ties into. Uh, what we what we read in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and as I said earlier, I'll have a link to your Amazon author page if uh, people want to uh, check right. those out. And uh, you mentioned the Song of Solomon. Uh, I should actually announce myself and Spencer Krause, who was on last time as well. We will actually hopefully have sometime in August, uh, when I'm back from London, have an entire episode on the Song of Solomon in historical traditions as well as the Latter Day Saint tradition. So uh, beyond that, that'd be great. You know, it's a it's a it's an interesting book because it's not official. It's not part of the inspired version. And if you look in the LDS Bible, they don't really do that many footnotes on it. So yeah. um, it's kind of overlooked. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that particular episode will help in the, um, it, it no longer being overlooked because like, uh, if you're reading Hebert's beautiful poetry and like the history of interpretation of it, like the uh, 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 organs, allegorical interpretation of the text. And one of my main areas of interest is in Mariology. So especially in the medieval period, you have this flowering of, um, the bride being Mary and like how it's used as uh, her being cool beat tricks and go cool redemptrix tricks and all that fun stuff. So, uh, yeah. that's something to look forward to, to our listeners. Um, and once the episode drops, we'd love to have your feedback on that as well, Adam. Uh, but as I said, like, uh, uh really that's do you appreciate your time and hopefully we can actually have you on again to discuss, I yeah, love guess, that. maybe love as a that. recurring yeah. guest, but definitely to discuss your Moses seven article. Um, and maybe like say interact with maybe some of uh would you change a few things would you like uh expand a few on a few things since it's been published and so forth but definitely have an episode definitely on that particular topic as well and hopefully we can actually have a uh, friendly dialogue on like a uh, book of mormon and early uh revelations when it comes to modalism and uh, all that fun stuff as well if you're down with that i'd that totally would, be down for that yeah we're, totally we're both theology uh, grads so like at least we yes. could actually discuss that and uh, i think it would be friendly it wouldn't be like a fight frolic so um no absolutely not no. yeah but uh, as i said like i'll leave uh, links to uh the uh, church's official website uh, where you can find uh, the various uh, works they have including the uh, revelations as a pdf and um also adam's um inter uh, author page on amazon.com as well as his, uh, article um on moses 7 that i mentioned uh, that was my first uh, interaction with adam so uh, adam uh, again really appreciate the time you've given us and hopefully uh, this uh, episode will be informative for those here wondering about one of the uh, smaller groups when the uh, broad restorationist perspective and not just what you believe but also why you believe what you do as well hopefully it will be a useful resource and um, as i said hopefully we'll have you on again real soon so um, thank you again for your time this was a pleasure thank you so much rob have a great day you too